everybody and welcome to today's ASMR session so today I thought I would do something a little different and read a book to you all as So, the book I have today is Nature Julia Rothman. Um, the first thing I want to address, as I do with most of my videos, is that there is one sound which I pretty much is almost impossible for me to remove, um, and that's my hamster. Um, he's actually right outside my door. He's running on the wheel. So, you may be able to hear that, but I will try to edit out that sound as much as possible. And as you can hear right now, there is a plane flying over, but I hope that these sounds won't bother your experience too much. And I hope they add to the realness that the bedtime story it's hopefully going to be interesting educational and relaxing all at the same time so I chose this book because I actually wanted to read this over the summer and um, to be honest <laughs> I just haven't gotten the chat so I guess it is still summer, so I am fulfilling my goal, but I thought I would read it with you guys because I flicked through it the other day and it looks super interesting. <laughs> um, the reason why I have this book is because I'm actually very interested in earth nature and animals especially as you can tell from the name of the channel earthly asmr i am very much into that kind of stuff um so why not get started and read this curious parts and pieces of the natural world So, the illustrations are probably the most interesting and probably most important selling points of this book. And she designs it super well, as you can tell. So you have um, illustrations of um, a fiddlehead or a common orange lichen or hmm, a two-spotted ladybug beetle so I really love the illustrations and that's what most people buy this book for Let's go through the first chapter. So, 
I am planning to read this whole book with you guys and there are seven chapters but I probably won't be able to make it through the whole chapter especially chapter one in one video so I'm going to do half of chapter one first and then I will go to the other half of chapter one in another video so this is the contents page and I'll be reading the introduction to you first which is on page six then moving on to chapter one common ground really moving layers of the earth minerals the rock cycle fossils landforms mountains North American landscapes field succession loose and landscape painting so I'm going to zoom in on the words just so that you can follow along I hope there isn't too much glare but so, the introduction A couple of years ago after finishing my last book Farm Anatomy and learning so many incredible things about growing and preserving food identifying animals and the way harvesting works my hunger for more green knowledge grew. I wanted to continue my journey as a city dweller studying the natural world. It's a very beautiful illustration of some flowers there. I grew up on City Island in the Bronx in New York City on a block that ends with a beach as most of the streets on the island do collecting and categorizing shells studying horseshoe crabs undersides and swallowing salt water were part of my childhood even though we could see iconic skyscrapers glowing across the water. My sister and I spent summers at camp, hiking in the woods in upstate New York, and sleeping in tents outfitted with lots of bug spray to satisfy my overprotective mother. I really loved nature as a kid and looked forward to outdoor adventures at every opportunity whether it was a family vacation to Maine or a weekend trip to a neighbor's log cabin but as I got older I became a city girl at heart my teenage years were spent sneaking out to nightclubs downtown and hanging out on the sidewalks of the Lower East Side. That child who loved collecting live bugs and growing crystals, encouraged by my dad, the science teacher, was replaced by a re rebellious adolescent who wore black and white checkered stockings with denim skirts and chased skateboarders in Union Square.
While I live in the middle of the city, in Park Slope, Brooklyn, I am only a few buildings away from the entrance to Prospect Park, which I visit on a daily basis, most often for a dog walk or a long run. While it seems a far leap to call these tiny, journeys and nature walks. I cherish being surrounded by greenery for just a small period of time each day. It keeps me sane to be able to smell some grass after being squished like a sardine in a subway car. I really look around the park wanting to know more. What is that tree with the beautiful leaves called? When will those flowers I saw last year show up again? Are those really bats flitting above our heads? How funny to see so many dragonflies attached, making love. My curiosity continues to grow, and that's how the idea for this book took shape. I am glad my work has taken me back to a nostalgic place where I can begin to appreciate the things I was intrigued with as a kid. It's about as fair to call this a nature book as it is to call my little walks nature hikes. There is no way to include even a small portion of the enormous world around us in any book of any size. Where does it end? There is an infinite amount to learn about, from the constellations to the core of the earth. I guess I think of this project as my nature book. It's the information I was interested in learning about, the things I wanted to draw and paint. While it is only a teeny scratch on the surface, it gives me a chance to become acquainted with plants animals, trees, grasses, bugs, precipitation, land masses, and bodies of water that I wanted to be able to name when I walked by. My friend John has always been an influential green voice telling me about what he cooks from his plentiful gardens, how he saved some infested fruit trees in the neighbor's yard, and how he finds ingredients in his backyard. For this project, I asked John to literally guide me on my path and show me some cool stuff I might not have found myself. And that's John right there in his hat and sunglasses. Seems like a pretty cool guy to me. So before we move on, I just wanted to show you this bookmark. This is actually from one of my best friends. And she actually got me this bookmark while um, visiting her home in Poland this summer. And I thought it was so beautiful and so fitting to go in this book. <laughs> because it has all the fruit, the flowers, the trees, the birds 
and I just think it's so beautiful. So that is what we're going to be using at the end of every session, just so that we know exactly where we are. So, on to page 8. As we walked through Prospect Park one afternoon, John picked some leaves and encouraged me to eat them. I was a bit worried about what dog may have relieved himself from the plant, but eventually obliged. Chewing while he laughed at my reaction to the flavour. We walked through the park, picking and tasting, and critiquing the bitterness, sweetness, and texture of all the edibles right under our noses. I had no idea I could make such a colourful salad from my Brooklyn Park. And if this park could give us this much, I could only imagine what we could forage from actual deep woods. If it weren't for John, this book wouldn't have become what it is, as he was my teacher and I was a student. He wrote and edited and helped me formulate ideas for the product and I followed his lead. And while I ultimately decided what I wanted in this book, you can find his voice on every page. This book is now an object, a finished piece of work that we are both proud to hold in our hands. But I won't stop drawing flowers or looking up birds that I see in the park in my sibling guide. John will continue telling me about his vegetable garden and plans for next year about the trips he takes to visit specific natural phenomena. It's a continuous lifeline project for us to appreciate our surroundings, whatever they may be. And this book is just a tiny piece of evidence of that. I hope our book inspires you to be curious about your own backyard too, whether it's rolling hills or a flower box on a fire escape. Julia Rothman. And this is the park she was mentioning that is behind her building right there. Prospect Park. And there's the Grand Army Plaza up there. A botanic garden. This is the park where she says her running loop is 3.3 miles. Which I don't know how people do that, but it's pretty amazing. Okay. So on to chapter one. This is such a beautiful illustration. And we have some illustrations of fossils, corals, rock forms, etc. So we're on chapter one. Common ground. So, this two-page spread is called Really Moving. It has the sun in the middle, that's kind of um, a little messed up, <laughs> but it says our 
planet Earth hurtles through space at nearly 67,000 miles per hour. Its vast oceans and land masses support more than 2.5 million of species of living things, including 7 billion humans. We have spring, where the Earth spins on its axis, its central axis, at a thousand and forty miles per hour, completing one revolution per day. But the Earth doesn't stand perfectly upright as it spins. It is always leaning over at about 23.5 degrees. So you have the vernal equinox in spring, and then in summer. Summer is warmer than winter in each hemisphere because the days are longer and the sun's rays hit the earth head-on in the summer and less directly in the winter and the summer solstice actually occurs in summer which is the longest day of the year and following that is autumn where At the autumnal equinox, hours of daylight and darkness are roughly equal. The direction of orbit of the Earth is anti-clockwise. And each year, the Earth completes one lap around the Sun. It's a 585 million mile orbit. It's almost perfectly round. The differences between the four seasons, spring, summer, winter, and autumn, are the results of this little tilt in the Earth's axis. This tilt causes the hemispheres of the globe to face the sun more directly at different times of the year. So in winter, there's the winter solstice, which is the longest night of the year. Now we will move on to layers of the earth so all you geography students like me well, previous geography students will probably have learned a little bit about this layers of the Planet Earth was formed 4.54 billion years ago. Most of what we know about the structure of the Earth comes from studying the seismic waves that pass through the planet during earthquakes. Earth is distinctly layered and each layer has its own unique characteristics. The crust. Which is this light blue first layer. The Earth's crust is between 3 and 44 miles thick, being the thickest where there are land masses and thinnest between 
beneath the oceans. It makes up less than 1% of the planet's total volume. The mantle, which is this dark red bit over here, it says This layer of iron and magnesium rich silicate rock is hot enough between 930 and 7200 Fahrenheit. That is flows very slowly, causing earthquakes as the surface plates shift atop it. The mantle composes 84% of the Earth's volume. The outer and central core. So you have the outer core, which is the orange bit, the inner core, or central core, which is the yellow bit. The core has two parts. The outer core is primarily molten iron. The central core, an alloy of iron and nickel, is under so much pressure that it is crystallized into a solid, even though it is hotter in the surface of the sun. Now we're moving on to one of the subjects that I am actually extremely interested in, and that is minerals, which are naturally occurring solid substances consisting of inorganic materials. There are more than 4,000 identified minerals, with more being discovered every year. We have, and please forgive me for any names that I pronounce wrong <laughs> in this video, but I'm trying my best. We have rhodo crossite, halite, which is so pretty, and turquoise mineral. We also have ice, which is the most common mineral on Earth, or one of them. However, liquid water is not a mineral. Interesting. Okay. So we have copper, um, gypsum desert rose, and this one's really gonna be hard to pronounce. Um, Jerem Javite? Jerema Javite. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but the minerals form through crystallization, which is through the evaporation of a solution, like salt water evaporating into salt. Through cooling, natural water freezing, or magma solidifying, through changes in surrounding pressure and temperature. For example, at faults and other tectonically active zones. And we also have quartz, which we've all heard of, hopefully. If not, here you go. Beautiful diagram. Hematite and azurite malachite. I have no idea if I'm saying that right. <laughs> and we move on to the rock cycle. 
the dynamic transitions take place among different types of rocks over long periods of time. So we have igneous rocks, and they start as magma. So magma starts to cool into an igneous rock, and through heat and pressure, it becomes a metamorphic rock, and that once again melts into magma. Or the igneous rock can melt back to magma, but it can also become sediment through weathering and erosion. The same with the metamorphic rock, which can also become sediment through weathering and erosion and through compaction, I believe, and cementation. I think <laughs> sediment becomes sedimentary rock and through heat and pressure again, it becomes a metamorphic rock. So, the diagram shows that rocks are altered or destroyed by natural forces. Heat, pressure, friction, and weathering. So, how are rocks classified? So, they're classified based on how they are formed. So first, we have igneous rocks, which are like granite, basalt, I believe, and obsidian, which is one of my personal favorites. Magma is molten rock beneath the surface of the earth. When magma cools and solidifies, at or near the surface creates igneous rock. And then we have sedimentary rocks like conglomerate sed sedimentary rocks, mudstone, or limestone. As bits of minerals settle into layers over thousands of years, the weight of water and the layers of sediment above press down and cement the minerals into sedimentary rock. And lastly, metamorphic rock, which is gneiss, oh gosh, <laughs> schist, and slate. When sedimentary or igneous rocks are subjected to extreme pressure and heat, their mineral structures transform, resulting in metamorphic rock. Okay, moving on to fossils. Fossils. The chances of an organism's being preserved as a fossil are very small. For a fossil to form, the organism must be covered in sediment shortly after its death. Then, water with high mineral content enters the small pores and cavities of the organism. With time and pressure, the minerals in the water are deposited in the structure of the organism and solidify leaving behind a three-dimensional fossil. This is a perch from Green River Formation of Southwest Wyoming, USA. But not all parts of a creature become fossilized. Soft parts of the anatomy, like skin and internal organs, often decompose before fertile Sorry, fossilization. And that is a trilobite from Marium Formation, I think, in Millard County, Utah. 
but there are also microfossils. For example, we have Discosphera tubifera, that is amazing, and the fossil shell of a plankton, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word, <laughs> but there it is, ladies and gents and apparently these are magnified millions of times which kind of makes me freak out <laughs> but microfossils the fossils displayed in museums are macrofossils that is larger than one millimeter and visible to the naked eye vastly more numerous and microfossils are microfossils sorry guys the tiny preserved remains bacteria diatoms fungi protists invertebrates shells or skeletons pollen and bits of bones and teeth of vertebrates microfossils usually occur in large numbers in all kinds of sedimentary rocks. The Egyptian pyramids were built with sedimentary rocks made up of shells of foraminifera a major microfossil group. That is the radiotaria. Radiolaria? I did not think this through, guys. <laughs> it's okay. So we are at the last section of tonight's reading. And that is... Landforms. And first we have the canyon, which I've actually never been to a canyon before. And it is classified or defined as a deep river valley with very steep sides, carved into the land by rivers over long periods of time. So we have the Antelope Canyon in Arizona, where this slot canyon was formed by flash floods eroding the sandstone. We also have the Nine Mile Canyon in Utah, where you can see an ancient petroglyph on the side of a cliff in this canyon. I wonder what that is. So if any of you guys know what that is, petroglyph, I don't know, comment down below. And we also have the Grand Canyon. Oh, I did not know it was in Arizona. <laughs> well, I learn something new every day. And it is a 277 mile long, 18 miles wide, and over a mile deep. Which is crazy. Another type of landform is a cataract, which is a large powerful waterfall. For example, Yosemite Falls. I believe it's Yosemite. Yosemite. I remember I used to say Yosemite. <laughs> Guys, don't make fun of me. I've already made myself feel really bad for saying that for so many years. But it's Yosemite, right? Anyway, comment that too down below. <laughs> um, and this is the highest waterfall in North America. I did not know that. And of course we have Niagara Falls, which is on the border of Ontario, Canada, and New York. And it has the highest flow rate of any Okay. 
deltas. Deltas are a low triangle formation at the mouth of a river where silt, sand, and small rocks are deposited where the river meets a larger body of water. We also have an alluvial fan, and that is when large amounts of sediment is deposited by streams and rivers in a fan shape, most frequently where a canyon drains from mountains and spreads out over a flat plain, just like this diagram right here. It's a lot easier to understand with the diagram. On July 15th, 1982, Lawn Lake Dam in Rookie Mountain National Park, Colorado, failed. 30 million cubic feet of water carried tons of debris to an alluvial fan that is still prominent decades later. An archipelago, don't know if I'm saying that right again, <laughs> a cluster chain of islands found in a sea or ocean. Archipelago, archipelago, I don't know guys. <laughs> we also have an isthmus which is a narrow bridge of land connecting two larger land masses across a body of water. I feel like we have a lot of these in England, but I'm not sure. <laughs> and lastly, we have mountains. We have Aries. There is an accent on the E, so I'm not sure. But that is a thin ridge of rock left between the erosion paths of two parallel glaciers. A col, which is the lowest point on a mountain ridge between two peaks, also called a gap, notch, or saddle. We have plateaus, which are a massive area of flat terrain that is higher than the surrounding area. And I believe there's a place in Australia, right? It's really famous for that. Not sure. Or it might be a mess. <laughs> I don't know. A smaller area of elevated arid land with a flat top and sides that are usually steep cliffs. And lastly, a boot or a boote boot, an even smaller area of raised land with steep sides. Most boots were once larger mesas. Okay, so we've made it to the bookmark and we're leaving it at mountains tonight. So I hope you're feeling nice and sleepy after I've read to you tonight. And I really hope you join me again for the other half of chapter one. And I really genuinely enjoy this book.
Julia Rothman, who is both the author and the illustrator, with the help from her friend So I hope you enjoyed today's ASMR session, and thank you so much for joining.